Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, ecological and political crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Fred Hash, who is the co-founder of the Green Finance Observatory, an NGO that monitors what's going on in the world of sustainable finance, advises on policy, tries to get governments to do better, um, and generally exposes the lie that is green finance. We are not going to buy our way out of this climate crisis. And Fred came on the show today to explain how it's a fallacy, uh, why environmental regulation would be better, and why handing over the climate crisis to the market in order to find market-based solutions is one of the worst things that we could possibly do. He explains carbon credits. He explains biodiversity credits. He reveals that now water pollution credits are a thing in and of themselves. He explains tokenization and he explains how um, all of these sort of offset markets are linked to terrible abuses uh, of humans, uh, indigenous peoples and the natural world. This is a short episode. He had to run away to another meeting, but believe you me, it is a wealth of information uh, as to how the financial markets function and how the financialization of the climate crisis is undermining every single decent attempt at policy around the world. I hope you all enjoy the episode. Please do remember to share it. If you're enjoying Planet Critical in general, support the podcast at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. Becoming a paid subscriber or patron also supports my independent investigations into climate corruption around the world. I expose dangerous industry greenwashing and the world's worst climate fraudsters. If that's important to you, join the Planet Critical community who help make that happen. The link is in the description box below. And to those of you already supporting the project, thank you so much. Fred, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Perhaps. Good, I'm glad. So tell us a little bit about yourself, about your uh, history in finance, and then how you got into, you know, fighting the good fight against green finance. Uh, well, I originally come from uh, financial markets. I worked for 12 years uh, designing and selling currency derivatives, both in Paris and London. And then I quit that uh, career 10 years ago. Uh, and I started working for a think tank analyzing uh, EU financial legislation in the wake of the financial crisis to try and prevent the next one from happening. Mm -hmm. And then about four years ago, I, um, there was two new things happening in finance that seemed interesting. Uh, one was FinTech and the other one was uh, so-called sustainable finance. And I thought, okay, that's a new animal. It may be worth investigating. And um, that's how I started um, looking into uh, this world and this new trend towards creating um, financial markets on the environment and climate. Right. Okay. Interesting. And did, uh, just out of interest, did you continue your investigations with fintech at all, or did you just focus on sustainable finance once you got mm -hmm. wind of it? Um, but a lot of people <laughs> would work on fintech. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll focus on the other one. But then it turns out both, um, both topics are converging right now because uh, one of the big trends of 2022 is the tokenization of carbon offsetting, which means basically um, some to grow some so-called crypto green financial assets. So interestingly, uh, I now work on both topics. Mm, right. Let's give a, br uh, a sweeping overview of what sustainable finance is, and then we'll get into some of these more uh, particular categories of it. Um, so mm -hmm. how would you, in fact, how would people that promote sustainable finance, like the public to think of it? And then what do you think of it? Uh, well, sustainable finance in theory describes uh, the financing of activities that contribute to the sustainable development goals, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have different um, definition of sustainable finance that depends on your view of the world and your underlying assumptions. For example, <clears throat> if you follow what the IPCC is saying, right, about our remaining uh, carbon budget, the um, forthcoming 1.5 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. Then we need to, uh, the rich countries need to change their lifestyle. We need more sobriety, et cetera. 
Um, and so sustainable finance, according to the, this definition, in order to be compatible with IPCC findings, uh, would require, for example, financing only the activities that um, decrease our individual carbon footprint and our destruction of nature. Sorry, can you give an for example, example of... Sure. Yeah. Uh, home insulation, you know, to, uh, right. to, to, to reduce our consumption of energy, promoting uh, cycling or walking uh, through new urban planning. Etc. Mm -hmm. uh, promoting uh, vegeta vegetarian diets, less meat eating, etc. Right. The sustainable finance that is being promoted is based on an assumption of green growth, and that's very different. That's the idea that we can con continue to grow uh, the economy uh, mm -hmm. while uh, curbing our uh, emissions and our destruction. Now, this has been uh, thoroughly debunked because um, it has been shown that we cannot decouple economic growth from emissions and destruction at the scale required and during the time frame needed, which is this coming decade. So this is a bit of a misleading promise, this green growth promise. But anyway, if you define sustainable finance based on green growth, then it's a much wider definition, right? You can, it can include a lot more activities. Uh, if you look at the, um, the definition, for example, put by the European Commission, it will include uh, a, a super broad range that will include some agribusiness, will include some um, cattle farming, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. So you have not one, but several definitions of sustainable finance. So <clears throat> the sustainable finance that is being promoted mm -hmm. um, is based on this paradigm of, of growth. So is it about, in your pro professional opinion, sustainability or is it about protecting the financial markets from the need to contract the economy like is it putting our um economic paradigm above our ecological future yes absolutely uh i mean the the, the sustainable finance that is currently being promoted uh, clearly uh, continues to prioritize economic growth and competitiveness over uh, mm -hmm. environmental concerns over addressing the, the twin ecological crisis um, let me give you an example to show why, right? Hmm. If we were serious about addressing climate change and biodiversity loss, then we would put in place a traditional legally binding environmental regulation, mandating a phasing out of fossil fuels, for example, or curbing our destruction of nature, right? Now, if we did hmm. that, um, the, uh, future, the expected future profits of the impacted sectors would automatically adjust to the new regulation as they do with every regulation, right? And the capital flows would automatically uh, shift towards, uh, you know, the most profitable sectors as they do mechanically again. Mm -hmm. And so with traditional environmental regulations, all of finance would become sustainable mechanically. Okay. Right. Now, compare that to what is being done and called sustainable finance today, which is essentially um, a lot of subsidies for banks to very partially green their balance sheet. And you can tell that it is at best a B plan and shows a much lower level of ambition. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, every uh, financial market practitioner that I know seems the same. And um, um, to give you also um, a very prominent opinion is look at what Tariq Fancy wrote uh, extensively on this issue. Tariq Fancy is the former um, head of ESG at BlackRock, uh, the largest fund manager in the world. And he wrote that uh, sustainable finance is a deadly distraction. It is like giving homeopathics to a stage four cancer patient. Wow. So. So this sustainable finance is essentially about maintaining the status quo, maintaining economic growth and pretending to act at the margin. And we can see that also in the EU um, taxonomy of sustainable finance, which is uh, an EU wide list of activities considered green and that can be financed sustainably. And this list Such is as? absolutely not green. Um, I mean, this list is very problematic because it includes activities that are at green, but also activities, so-called transition activities that are absolutely um, dirty. 
uh, but are allowed mm -hmm. on a best in class basis. So, for example, if you, uh, I don't know, are um, an energy producer that or an, an industry, a polluting industry, but you're the one of the least worst in your sector, then you would be considered green and you would be eligible to issue green bonds and to get subsidies and favorable tax treatments and favorable prudential treatments, et cetera, et cetera. This is absolutely not compatible with IPCC findings. Uh, this taxonomy also includes um, very problematic other activities such as uh, carbon and biodiversity offsetting uh, that we can discuss later if you want. Yeah, definitely. I just want to kind of highlight the the cognitive dissonance of the fact that the IPCC report it takes three years to produce and is a collaborative effort of, of governments around the world. Scientists work on it for free, which I think is very mm -hmm. rarely acknowledged as well. They publish their findings and apparently governments are not putting into place the findings that they commission these scientists uh, to to report on. Why? What's happening there? Uh, there was a very interesting um, academic article published last year. Uh, I'm biased because I contributed to it. Uh, but <laughs> what I found interesting in this paper, it was an interdisciplinary paper, right? And mm -hmm. he asked experts from nine different disciplines what explains 30 years of failure to address climate change. Yeah. So they asked an economist, they asked an energy specialist, they asked um, climate specialist, etc., a philosopher, etc. And what was interesting is there was a common response that emerged from all disciplines. And the conclusion was that it was not a question of lack of awareness from governments. It was not a lack of solutions. It was a question of power dynamics and vested interest, primarily. Mm. What that means is that just like the big oil companies have known for 40 years exactly what is happening with climate change, Obviously, governments have known for the same length of time. Now, uh, no government or uh, no private company wants to give up the power and uh, economic uh, gain uh, attached to oil reserves, for example. And um, rich countries, governments do not want to um, help their citizens change lifestyles towards more sobriety. It's that simple. I mean, we're facing a choice where, you know, either we rich countries change their lifestyle and we may have a shot at having a reasonably acceptable common future and that's not even given or continuing as we do and uh, knowing full well what it means in terms of hundreds of millions of climate migrants and billions of days death over the coming uh, decades and the end of the century. And if you look at not just what is being told, but at the measures being taken that are clearly inappropriate and inadequate, then it seems pretty clear that we're choosing the second option, but we're just not willing to admit it. Mm. And that's not me saying it again. I mean, um, this, you had a very, one of a uh, very famous uh, philosopher writing about it, Bruno Latour, who wrote about in a famous essay, about what he called the, uh, cessation of the elites. Right. Okay. So they know. They don't know how to get off the treadmill that they've put into place or that, you know, neoliberalism put into place. Or they don't want to. They appear to think that they can, <laughs> be... I don't know, that uh, their own financial markets will continue to exist even whilst the world is uh, burning up. It's quite, it's, to be I mean, fair, I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're a government today and you wanted to really act on climate change, um, mm -hmm. it would most. You would most certainly not be reelected. Uh, you, you would not be popular, uh, and it might cause also, uh, uh, you know, some economic recession to some extent, etc. So, you know, this is a difficult choice. You know, I'm not saying that it's an easy thing to do, and that's explained why, um, you know, everybody's shooting the can down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what we would need is governments more focused on their legacy than their re-election. You know, doing the right thing because mm -hmm. the alternative is so much worse and so much more costly. That's a very nice um, way of looking at it. So let's get into um, some of these, whatever it is that they are proposing, uh, the biodiversity offsets, carbon credit. Let's start with carbon credits, because I think that's probably a term that people recognize and are aware that it's happening. Mm -hmm. What is the carbon credit market? 
and why is it nonsense? Um, you okay? There are two types of carbon credits. You have one that is the cap and trade market, whereby uh, uh, corporations that pollute that emit greenhouse gases have to purchase credits uh, corresponding to their emission, right? And there is an annual number of credits issued by the government. And this uh, number of credit is supposed to decline annually to, um, force companies to, you know, reduce their emissions. Now in practice, um, I mean, the, the biggest of this market is the EU market. And, uh, because of lobbying by private companies, there's been always far more credits issued than, uh, actual emissions. So it's actually been completely useless for the past 15 years. And surprisingly, because I mean, there is, I mean, it, how could it work when you have much more credits than emissions? There is no incentive for corporations to cut their emissions. Now, the second type of carbon market is even worse. It's, um, carbon offsetting and essentially offsetting is the idea that instead of curbing our emissions, uh, we could, uh, compensate by some actions such as, um, producing renewable energy or planting some trees to sequester um, CO2, etc. Now, one thing to understand is that offsetting by definition is not about mitigating climate change because offsetting is not about curbing emissions and offsetting is not about sequestering past emissions, the two activities that are mitigation. Offsetting is about enabling future emissions and offsetting future emissions. So essentially offsetting is about you know, helping economic growth, right? Now, um, there's many, many issues with offsetting. Uh, I mean, it has been shown that the biggest offset market, which was the Kyoto, uh, clean development mechanism set up by the UN, um, uh, had 85% of these offset projects fail, which is tremendous. Um, a lot of these projects were also associated. Yes. That, and that's from a, a study from the European Commission, these findings and these figures. And in addition, it's been shown that many of offset projects were associated with human rights abuse, um, land, land grabbing, and, and conflicts over land rights and land use. Because essentially what it comes down to is, uh, instead of, um, rich countries curbing their emissions, essentially, uh, they're going to buy cheap land in low income countries and plant a few trees and pretend that it compensates. That's what it comes down to. Mm. Mm. Um, these markets have been relatively niche up until recently, but as, um, there is a growing public awareness about climate change, uh, there is scaling up very quickly and you have, um, also a number of strong lobby, um, in the UK pushing for the scaling up of this market. And, uh, it seems as well that uh, these markets are perceived as an opportunity for the city of London to reinvent itself as an international, uh, carbon, uh, finance hub. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot, a uh, lot of stuff here. And so these markets are also considered in the EU taxonomy as part of sustainable finance. And so tomorrow, uh, your, uh, if you go to your bank branch asking for a sustainable savings product. Uh, you could mm. be sold something that bets on the future price of carbon, et cetera. It is astonishing. I think also what is astonishing is that outside of Europe, this, this market is completely unregulated, right? Which is why we have, uh, we see deals being made in, Bor in Borneo, uh, in the state of Sabah, uh, in which a sort of one or two man company can come in, bribe, allegedly bribe <laughs> somebody in government. And then mm -hmm. um, qualify all of Sar Sabah's forests as being worth eighty billion dollars, and locking in indigenous people into a deal over a hundred years that mm -hmm. pays out eighty billion dollars. Like, who is coming up with these prices? And how can anybody think that this will actually battle climate change if it is unregulated? Um, and how can anybody think it's sustainable if it's also involving land grabbing from indigenous people? I mean, we've seen Mexico is absolutely detailed the fact that. It, Indigenous people are being thrown off of their lands in order to take their land and put it on the carbon credit market. How can uh -huh. any of this be seen as sustainable? Um, I'm not sure it is seen as sustainable. It is seen as uh, doing something at the margin while not disrupting economic growth. 
which is not the same mm. as I understand it. Now, there's uh, a few things to understand about these offsets is that, um, I mean, they're not capping emissions. For example, there is a massive new carbon offset market for a civil aviation emission, right? So, uh, right. but this market is called Corsia and civil aviation emissions are expected to double over the coming decades while, uh, you know, offsetting, allegedly offsetting them with planting trees. So this is absolutely not the same as capping emissions, which is what we should be doing. There is also the issue that uh, there is not enough land available for all uh, the uh, um, offset commitments. I mean, if you, uh, the last figure I saw was that if you look at all the offset commitments uh, already being made, right, that would require an area the size of China to plant trees. And obviously there is not such an area that is available to do it, which means that the offsetting route uh, may act as a conflict multiplier. And then there mean? is the fact that, um, what does that mean? That, I mean, you know, people will fight over land. Uh, people will uh, fight over land use. You know, how do you use the land? Do you use it for agricultural, for urban development, or for planting trees and carbon farming? This is already happening in Wales, for example, where um, there was an article in the Times a few months ago where Welsh farmers are being uh, priced out by London investment firms to uh, purchase farms at auctions as, and the, the London firms uh, plant trees and collect the carbon credits. Mm. Uh, so th this is uh, all obviously uh, rather problematic. We can keep circling around this. This is probably the, the one bit of this green finance I actually know a little bit about. Um, tell me, does nobody... Um, I'm asking you a question that obviously you can't answer, but rather I just want to highlight sort of the um, the surreal time that we live in, that the offset market, at the size of land required to plant trees to fulfill the uh, the commitments of the offset market is the size of China. At the same time, we're continuing to log all of our precious rainforests that have ecosystems and are inherently more uh, valuable than any new sort of mm -hmm. mono crop culture would be and um and it's madness yes please continue no no and you know the, the point i wanted to make is that you know for all this focus on tree planting and carbon sequestration in trees at the same time we have growing evidence that due to uh, global warming trees capture less and less co2s i mean the, the amazon rainforest uh, may turn from a carbon uh, sink to a carbon source and also we see every year more and more uh, forest uh, going up in smokes so obviously yeah. this is a very temporary form of sequestration that is not um, very viable and less and less viable as an option. I think it's all, it is also interesting how this cognitive dissonance of like seeing it as a carbon commodity rather than a sort of any forest as a, as a piece of nature as something that is valuable inherently in itself, which is, of course, the danger mm -hmm. with financializing the climate crisis, that everything comes to bear the, a dollar price rather than trying to intuitively understand that it bears some other kind of value. Um, so the fact that we're not trying to protect the Amazon more because A, it could go up in flames, which would be a disaster. B, it could turn into a carbon source rather than a carbon sink, but also just because it is one of the most valuable things that we have on a, on the planet, just in its very richness of life. Um, it just, I think, goes to show how dangerous this sort of financialization path um, is and how it's obviously not leading us to solutions. To answer your question, it's very interesting because there's been a shift over the past decades uh, from um, regulation to economic incentives. And this is not anecdotal, and this has severe consequences. Uh, there's this idea that's been promoted by um, lobbies and the Davos crowd that uh, traditional regulations are too coercive for business, and we should incent ins instead incentivize business through subsidies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> now, that's very problematic on many levels because um, if you do that, you, I mean, this has been shown to be uh, less effective, but. Um, Shit, if, wait, where, where, where was my point? Yes, sorry. The, 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 the issue with shifting from, the issue with shifting from regulations to economic incentives 
uh, one of the main issues that are associated with it is that if you make addressing climate change and biodiversity loss uh, based on cost-benefit analysis and profitability considerations, then this is uh, far thicker than conservation uh, based on regulations. Because there will always be a time where it's more profitable to destroy than to conserve. I mean, it's been evidence mm. amply. So this is one of the reasons why uh, when we're making policy choices affected the affecting the future of humanity, this should absolutely not be based on profitability considerations and uh, prices and economic incentives. I mean, we do not that. I mean, in, in other crucial areas of policy making, such as, I don't know, fighting terrorism or whatever, um, policy choices are not based on cost benefit fit analysis. Why, on what ground uh, would we uh, make uh, fighting climate change and biodiversity loss a question of, um, you know, economics? Could you warrant a, a guess as to why that has been the case? Uh, yeah, it's the same reason. I mean, we know that um, uh, if you transfer uh, this to financial markets, then you can always promise uh, that things will work once the price is right. So right. this is again about acting at the margin without disrupting uh, growth and competitiveness, ultimately. Right. And with the added benefit of creating a new uh, asset class for financiers as a new playground. Right. Okay. Uh, but but this is this is very this is very worrying because this has other implications. For example, the the recent uh, suggestion uh, in the consultation by the UK government uh, to create a market on uh, biodiversity destruction and um, other uh, other markets means in practice that uh, we may transfer to financial markets. The, the defining of the value of what is to be saved and what is not to be saved and essentially transferring to a short term um, financial, private financial interest and the irrational mm. moods of financial markets uh, are conservation policies on which our survival depends. And that's a massive transfer of power and that's a major decision. And so that would require, in my opinion, uh, some serious public debate um, before uh, such a decision is being made. Well, first they came for the treetops, then they came from for everything living below it. Um, how is this? Let, let's discuss what a biodiversity market is then, because you said it's sort of creating a market out of the destruction of biodiversity. Um, I think for most people that they won't know what that means. And of course, these bills are currently going through Parliament uh, completely out of public debate, even though they should be in. So what is actually happening? What does a biodiversity offset market look like? How do they make it look like it might be a good idea on the surface? And then what is actually going on? Right. So uh, there is this um, um, biodiversity net gain uh, proposal, according to which uh, basically you would monitor um, the state of biodiversity in the UK uh, through a net gain matrix. Net means offsetting, and it's very problematic because it mixes together curbing destruction and restoration. Mm. And that's problematic because restoration is absolutely not comparable to not destroying. I mean, we, mm. there is very little evidence that we're able to recreate all the ecosystemic functions being destroyed. Uh, on the other hand, restoration is much cheaper than not destroying. So if you mix them together in one objectives, then you implicitly favor destroying to restore as opposed to conserving. And that's very problematic. Now, uh, the proposal that are being suggested in the uh, 2021 Environment Act and uh, subsequent consultations are uh, that developers, for example, uh, who want a, a building permit uh, to build, I don't know, an airport, a highway or whatever, uh, and that will have an adverse impact on biodiversity need to uh, compensate uh, for the adverse impact and in fact uh, compensate more than the impact to have a net 10 percent net gain so they can do that by either so they have to follow a so-called mitigation hierarchy right so first they try to they're supposed to try to avoid and minimize the impact and then if there's any residual impact they can offset it now in practice um it's not clear how this would be enforced and who would monitor how you follow the different steps. In fact, there is evidence mm. that the steps are not really uh, followed. 
And the offsetting can take several forms. So you can either restore on site by, I don't know, uh, if you destroy the habitat for a uh, species, uh, recreate this habitat for a species nearby, it can be done off site. And, or alternatively, you can purchase credits from the government. Uh, now, uh, if, if the habitat that has been destroyed is considered of a medium or low distinctiveness, you're allowed to uh, compensate the destruction of a habitat by another type of habitat of higher distinctiveness, whatever that may be. And that means that you can destroy a habitat for one species and claim to compensate by restoring or recreate, attempting to recreate a habitat for another species in another place. Obviously, uh, from an environmental perspective, this doesn't make sense at all. Now, uh, what that does is that because compensations become generic, uh, then you can uh, also restore in advance before destroying, collect uh, credits, and then uh, trade these credits until um, they're being used. So in fact, the, the, the bill foresees that developers who um, restore more than they destroyed uh, can then sell their extra credits to other developers. And that's how, uh, and then create a market to trade these credits that are essentially permits to destroy biodiversity elsewhere. Now, it's important to understand that uh, there's absolutely zero need for a market from a conservation perspective. From a conservation perspective, you should uh, focus on curbing destruction. And then if there is to uh, some restoration uh, and offsetting to be done, it should be with the same type of habitat uh, period, or even better, it should be bespoke, right? Rather than generic. So the allowance to do that aims purely at minimizing the cost of compliance for private corporation, which in itself is a legitimate objective, but it should not come at the cost of environmental integrity, given the emergency that we're facing. So you're saying that there is a myriad of other ways uh, to protect biodiversity, namely through environmental regulation, through governance, uh, and rather they've There's handed this... this over to the market, and that is in order to create a market to kind of enable business as usual and for private corporations to continue to do as they wish. There is this idea that regulation has failed and we should try something different, namely transferring it to market. And, and that's an interesting and strongly debatable starting point because yes, uh, we haven't curbed uh, destruction so far. That is not to say that regulation doesn't work. In fact, regulation works very well, but there hasn't been enough regulation simply because of the constant opposition of private lobbies. So it's really ultimately a question of political um, will and ambition. So there hasn't been enough political ambition in the past. Um, as we're... Uh, getting more and more aware of the emergency that may change in the future, except if we keep on diverting the conversations towards um, alternative false solutions, such as financial markets, such as uh, upsetting, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, because the, the, the issue with these ideas is that they divert the conversation away from the need to curb emissions and destruction. I mean, what, what can we do then? Um, because there were a couple of things that you said off camera as well uh, before we started this recording about, you know, like water pollution credits. It looks like they are trying to tokenize every single part of the sort of, you know, overshoot of planetary boundaries, whether it's planetary health, ecosystem health, human health. Um, what do you think are uh, the mechanisms that need to be put in place in order to better protect our environment? Uh, and I assume that it would be, you know, go beyond environmental regulation. What needs to be done? I mean, ultimately, um, it's, um, you know, what works best from a, an environmental perspective and what we need to do is pretty clear according to the IPCC and, and other, uh, you know, scientific bodies. We need to uh, curb drastically our emissions and our destruction, which requires a change of lifestyle and some urgent environmental regulations to, uh, I don't know, ban domestic flights, uh, ban the sale of SUVs, encourage uh, curbing of eating red meat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's what would work. As long as you have governments who prioritize economic growth and competitiveness, we will fail. We will continue to head into a wall and sacrifice the future uh, generations. So ultimately, this is a battle for a public opinion, right? Um, 
So yeah, it's good that people pay attention, are aware, um, make them voices heard, etc. And at the very least, have a, you know, that we have an informed public debate about these issues, as opposed to, uh, you know, just letting that to a handful of experts with a uh, potential conflicts of interest in some cases. Mm. What else do you think they are going to try to tokenize in the future? Do you think that this is kind of the beginning of a trend to tokenize absolutely everything? Um, there was some um, news recently that uh, a lobby group is uh, pushing for a market for nature in the UK, going beyond biodiversity and going also to uh, water pollution credits, air pollution, uh, flood prevention, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was a member of government that indicated that the government was committed to working with this coalition to make it happen. So it would seem that uh, a biodiversity market is only the first of many to come. And that's a first or uh, the ultimate stage of um, financializing uh, nature uh, in addition to already all the rest. That is absolutely mad. Do you know the name of the, the lobbying group? I don't have it anymore on top of my head. Do you, what are the main um, financial lobbyists at play in the European uh, government and the UK government? Tricky and uh, it's it's complicated to I don't know I know the EU lobbies the EU lobbies yeah uh, in the UK I'm less familiar I know a few figures but um, naming people is problematic. Yeah, um, sure, 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 so. sure, sure. So, Fred, I, I know you have to run off early. Um, first of all, thank you for your time. And second of all, my final question, mm, sure. who would you like to platform? Um, I, there are many people that are really interesting, uh, from Kevin Anderson, who is a famous climatologist, to Yuta Kiel, who is an incredible biologist, to Clive Spash, who is one of the best economists. But I would go for uh, Martin Pigeon. Uh, Martin mm -hmm. works for an NGO called Fern and is one of the best experts on um, biomass and um, the, all the issues surrounding uh, it in legislation. Oh, excellent. So that's, this, is this is another angle of the, hmm? yeah. this is another angle, but this is a very relevant angle. Wonderful. Fred, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Have a good afternoon. If you want to learn more about sustainable finance, I've put links to the Green Finance Observatory in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is also in the description box below. Supporting the podcast also directly supports my climate corruption investigations, so a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.